Good morning to everyone um, joining the session today. Thank you so much for joining um, what is the first instalment of a new series of seminars called Regulate and Resolve, where we pick through common financial services regulatory issues and provide practical guidance on how to approach them. So before we begin, by way of introduction, um, my name is Rachel McDonald. I'm a principal associate in um, the disputes team here at Mills and Reeve. Um, I split my time between general commercial disputes and financial services regulatory investigations. I'm joined today by Catherine Noble, who's an associate in my team. Um, she also has a practice in commercial disputes, also with a specialism in insolvency and financial services. Um, just so you know, this uh, session today is being recorded. Um, and we'll circulate the slides after the presentation. There's also a Q&A function, so please do ask questions and we'll try and pick those up separately, um, either at the end or after the session. So just moving on to the next slide, a bit of an overview of what we're gonna talk about today. So self-reporting issues can be a really difficult area um, and they often involve a lot of challenging judgment calls. And today we're focusing on FCA regulated firms, but if you're also regulated by the PRA, then there'll be separate, or, uh, separate reporting obligations to consider in respect of them. Bit of an overview on what we're covering. Catherine is going to talk through when do key reporting obligations arise, looking at principle 11 and then the rules uh, on general notifications in the FCA handbook in sub 15. Um, I'll have a quick look at what other notifications firms might need to be making. Um, when they're also thinking about self-reporting to the FCA. Then we'll consider what next. And then finally, um, Catherine will talk about privilege and communications. And we'll wrap up with any questions um, at the end if there's time. So moving on to uh, Principle 11. Okay. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so the FCA's regulations are underpinned by 11 principles which outline the regulatory obligations of firms which are authorised by the FCA. Now, whilst all regulated firms are going to have various reporting obligations, Principle 11, which is on the current slide, provides that financial services firms are required to deal with their regulators in an open and cooperative manner and to disclose to the FCA anything relating to the firm of which the regulator would reasonably expect notice of. Um, where a firm is regulated by the PRA, that's reflected in um, Fundamental Rule 7. Um, so as you can see, Principle 11 is a really broad obligation. Um, it applies to the firm's unregulated and regula regulated activities and takes into account the activities of other members of a group and its reach is territorial. Sorry, its territorial reach is worldwide. Um, so this raises a very immediate question question of in what circumstances would the FCA reasonably expect to receive notice and then secondly when. Um, so the supervision section of the FCA handbook provides a non-exhaustive list of events that the FCA considers would trigger a report. A common theme in those events is a change to the firm's risk profile. So for example where a firm is expanding its geographical reach or it's diversifying or even reducing the services that it offers. The key thing to remember is that the FCA expects your firm to deal with it in an open, open way. Um, and that whilst all, all, not all notifications will lead to an investigation, a failure to report a notifiable event is a breach of Principle 11 and actually could result in, in your firm being fined for a failure to report. Um, quite properly, your firm is going to be mainly concerned with events within the firm that might trigger a self-reporting obligation but it's also worth considering whether any third party issues might trigger a notification requirement under principle 11. So for example if your fir firm's auditor was to have a significant failure in its controls such as the data breach your firm would have a responsibility to notify the FCA. Um, just before we move on I want to mention that whilst principle 11 imposes an obligation on the firm to be cooperative cooperative with its regulators and to make the appropriate notifications. Rule four of the senior management conduct rules imposes a near identical obligation on senior managers. Um, and I'm just raising this as a failure to notify um, as a senior manager could also amount to a breach which could lead to enforcement action against the senior ma manager personally, as well as the firm. Right, if we could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so principle 11 imposes 
that overarching obligation to report to the FCA. Um, but the handbook um, in the supplementary section identifies a number of general notification requirements. And the current slide um, provides a non-exhaustive list of those um, requirements. Essentially, the slide um, points to the, the kind of general considerations that you're going to need to consider if making a report. So what is the event or the breach? Is it significant to the firm, its customers, or the regulated sector? Um, whether the FCA is going to require a notification, and if so, are there any specific notification requirements? And that's a really good general um, overarching framework to consider. Um, but we're just going to consider that in, in terms of the events that are on the slide. Um, so first, you're looking at the examples which are on the left-hand side, and to give them a little more colour. Um, your firm has to be um, very conscious about, about any breaches which might have a serious regulatory impact. Now, obviously, that's quite broad, but mainly breaches under that category are going to um, uh, encompass breaches of the regulatory perimeter. Um, when you come, when you're looking at breaches of um, requirements under the Act or the Consumer Credit Act, um, these breaches are going to be very, very specific to your firm. So we can't going into too much detail here, but I would just remind you that um, that will also include any breaches of principles, statements of principles, or the codes of conduct. So do look beyond the actual acts themselves. Um, it can be necessary to notify the FCA about legal actions faced by your firm. Now, any action against the firm which relates to disciplinary measures or fraud is going to be reportable, as are criminal um, actions. However, where your um, firm is in receipt of civil proceedings, that's only going to be reportable where the claim or claims are significant to the firm's financial resources or its reputation. And that can be a bit of a judgment call. So a small claim or a dispute with a supplier might not be notifiable, but a series of small claims, which will identify the same breach or a claim with a huge quantum would be notifiable. Um, the FCA requires notification of all fraud, errors and other irregularities as part of the oversight of its firm. And this goes to its wider mandate to help prevent harm that um, consumers may face or, or might be um, faced by the firms. When you're reporting anything to do with fraud or um, other irregularities, it's really important that, that details about the um, incident itself are given um, so that the FCA can see what action may need to be taken either with your firm or to warn other firms about issues that may arise with them. Um, given the implications of a firm's insolvency, particularly for its customers, the F FCA requires notification of insolvency, bankruptcy and winding up proceedings. Now they're quite obvious, but you need to consider insolvency in a wider context here. So, for example, the FCA would require notification if your firm was to be entering into an arrangement with one or more of its creditors. Um, and also, if, if the firm was a sole trader, even if the firm was OK, if the director was to be subject to bankruptcy proceedings, that would be notifiable because of um, the impact that any order would have on the management of the firm. Um, and then just finally, in, in terms of that list, um, you would need to report any significant competition or infringements. Um, again, that's quite wide, but I would just flag here that if you notify the FCA of a breach of competition law, that doesn't constitute any kind of application or leniency or immunity from penalty under the Competition Act. So that's just something to bear in mind. Now, the FCA doesn't encourage defensive self-reporting, so like really, really minor infringements, it's not going to be bothered about. Um, but it does give some guidance on what significance is um, where that is um, part of its reporting um, structure. Um, and significant will vary depending on the event. So just by way of example, and always, always, if you're reporting, go back and look at the handbook because it's really helpful. But by way of example here, um, for a breach of a rule, the significance will need to consider um, the potential fin financial losses to both the firm and its customers. 
um, how often that breach has occurred, whether there is any kind of implication for the firm's control systems, and if there were delays in either identifying the breach or rectifying it once it had been identified. The test for fraud is relatively similar. So again, you're looking at the financial um, potential loss to the um, firm or customer. Um, you're also looking at whether or not that um, highlights any kind of weakness in the firm's internal controls. The difference for significance with fraud is that you have to look at also the risk of reputational loss to the firm. Um, and then just to, to kind of complete the trio from that slide, uh, when looking at breaches of competition or significance is going to be determined by the actual potential effect, not just on the firm, but on the competition, um, any detriment to customers and the duration of any infringement and the implications for the firm systems and, and controls. So what you can see clearly is that whilst the nuances of significant might vary between reportable issues, the FCA is, is really interested in, in identifying the impact of the issue on the firm, the impact on its customers and the industry, and locating the cause of that issue, particularly where it's an issue that arises from the firm systems. Now, we appreciate that self-reporting to the FCA might not seem an attractive option, given the necessity to investigate the circumstances that give rise to the notification, um, the potential for an intrusive investigation into the firm's processes and potential public censure or financial penalties that might follow a report. However, failing to notify the FCA of reportable events um, can, can in and of itself result in a penalty. Um, and the FCA will regularly impose fines that can run to ten, tens of millions of pounds for failure to, to report. So you have to bear that in mind. And alongside the financial penalties, there's, there's also those really bad headlines that can run about misleading the regulator that you want to avoid. Um, on balance, where there is a doubt over whether or not to make a, a self-report, it is always better to err on the side, side of caution and to make the report to the FCA. If an issue has been spotted internally, it is probably best to raise it with the FCA. Notifications should be made as soon as practicable. Um, most notifications need to be made in writing and they can be made um, using a prescribed form, which can be found in the handbook. Um, and that could be delivered to the FCA um, either by post or email or using the FCA portal. Realistically, the portal and email are most used now. Um, some of the notifications have to be made immediately. Um, so it's always, always worth bearing in mind the urgency and significance of the matter that you're notifying the FCA about. Um, and you shouldn't make like, a delay unnecessarily. So, for example, there would be absolutely no need for you to delay the uh, reporting the receipt of a, a winding up um, petition. But say if your firm was to suspect fraud, you actually might need to, to make some preliminary internal investigations before you were to make a report. Um, but but the, those preliminary investigations should not delay the report being submitted. Um, and also, if your firm has got a supervisory contact at the FCA, it can be worth speaking to them before making a notification. Investigations can be intrusive, um, but the FCA does give credit to firms who assist in unraveling potential misconduct and, and who help them um, to conduct their inquiries quickly and efficiently. Um, so given that, um, and given the implications of, of an FCA investigation, um, where possible, you want to control the narrative and try to satisfy the FCA that the matter isn't something they need to take out of your hands. And so to that end, before handing back over to Rachel, I just want to touch briefly on the notification itself. So certain notifications require the firm to provide specific information. So principally, you're looking at whether there's been a breach for a rule or an act, identifying that the actual the rule that's been broken. Um, but broadly speaking, the notification will ask for um, information in quite an open manner in sort of essay style questions, which include what are the details of the notification? What if any impact, um, sorry, what, what is any, what is the impact, if any, of the notification? Um, and has the issue been resolved? As you can see from those questions, when making a notification, there is a lot of scope to control the tone of the report and to try and set the narrative. This is really important given the reputation and financial impact that a breach can have on the firm. Obviously, the FCA is not blind to this, um, 
but it is still worth really uh, getting that initial report right. Um, and you want to demonstrate as a firm how serious you, seriously you're taking that matter and to demonstrate the clear and proactive steps that you're taking to both identify the issue and then to assess and correct it. And that's something that Rachel will, will touch on later. Um, over to you, Rachel. You're on mute. Apologies there. So if we just move on to the next slide, um, thinking about other notifications. So often um, when I'm helping a firm make a notification to the FCA, there are other notifications that I might think about making as well. When I'm first instructed, I'm regularly thinking around these two areas on the screen, suspicious activities reports, and then obligate notifications to insurers. So is there an obligation on a client to make a suspicious activity report or star? And should any notifications to insurers be made? And taking those key points in turn, suspicious activity reports first. Under section uh, 330 of the Proceeds of Crime Act, it's an offence um, to disclose knowledge or offence of failing to disclose knowledge or suspicion of money laundering by persons employed in the financial services sector. So an individual commits an offence if they know or suspect another person is engaged in money laundering and they do not make a required disclosure either to a nominated officer, and that's usually a money laundering, money laundering reporting officer, or the National Crime Agency as soon as possible. Um, now, often people think, well, where does this come into it with money laundering? What does this have to do with, with the, the issues that we've identified? Um, but broadly, money laundering is defined very widely. And it basically involves acti any activities relating to criminal property, um, criminal property being of any benefit received from a criminal offence. So this often comes up where potential issues of criminality have been identified. Um, fraud, for example, is, another, is, a, is a very obvious one, but actually more regularly it arises where there's a, it also arises where there's a suspicion that a firm or an individual may have breached the regulatory perimeter. And what I mean by that is conducting regulated activities without the necessary regulatory permissions. And that's a, a, a breach of the general prohibition and a criminal offence. And so could well trigger, in addition to a report to the FCA, an obligation to report either to the firm's nominated officer or the NCA, and a failure to do that can be a criminal offence. So I won't go into the ins and outs of all of the different um, conditions that need to be satisfied here because they are technical, but what I will say is that that suspicion level is a very low bar um, and it needs to be considered um, in order even just to discount it, given that it's a criminal offence if you don't report. Uh, the second is around insurance, and this, of course, will depend on the issue that's been identified and the nature of insurance cover that the firm has in place. Um, but always consider um, whether there are any policies against which a notification might be made. For example, directors of an officer's insurance policies or corporate expenses cover um, perhaps professional indemnity if a misselling issue has been identified. Now, you aren't going to get any possible fines covered, but there may be costs for um, cover for costs involved, legal costs, for example. You don't want to notify too late and risk insurers declining cover or not being able to take the benefits of a policy that might be available. So those are just two other things to bear in mind when making that initial report. And if we move on to the next slide, we'll think about um, that all important question of what next. So as Catherine said earlier, she took you through the different circumstances in which a reporting obligation might arise and talked about the things that that initial notification needs to cover. Um, and you can see down the left hand side of the slide there, um, if you're using a standard notification form, then you're likely to be asked to identify the issue, um, talk about the impact of that issue, and then talk about the action that's being taken to resolve it. Um, and that form provides the structure to enable the firm to set out the details of the issues identified. And these are your key points to hit. And within them, as Catherine said, it's crucial to make sure you demonstrate how seriously the issues are being taken um, and the proactive steps the firm is taking to address them. There needs to be a real focus, particularly in the retail space, on potential customer harm. 
and it doesn't need to be actual it just needs to be potential so in terms of what those proactive steps might be uh, in your initial notification you're probably not going to be able to identify all of the steps you might not know the full impact of the breach without further analysis. So in the first notification, it's about showing the FCA that the matter is in hand and say what the firm is doing about it, and then providing further updates as mass matters progress and more is known. So that assessment and action section is really likely to be a bit of an iterative process and several updates might be needed to the FCA um, before you might be able to close out an issue. So a quick word on detail. Um, so far as possible, information should be kept factual and limited to what's known at the time. And firms should really avoid sort of speculating or providing information that they may need to roll back for or correct or clarify because that doesn't perhaps give the FCA the confidence that what they're hearing is, is accurate and therefore may lead them to think actually we need to become more involved here. At the same time, though, it's a careful balance because you do want to Hold, avoid holding back relevant information because failing to disclose pertinent details in a timely manner may later lead to criticism by the FCA. And you do see that quite a lot in internal investigations. People are waiting to tell the FCA something until they can resolve it. Um, and by the time they do, you know, a serious, a serious time has passed and the FCA um, may then say, actually, you should have told us earlier. Um, and that can be a principle 11 breach in itself. So what I want to do is use the rest of this section to just try to bring to life in a fairly generic way um, and illustrate some of the practical steps that might be taken with those um, assessing the impact, particularly actions boxes. Um, now, of course, the steps are clearly going to depend on the nature of the issue that's been identified, the scale of the issue and the particular regulatory requirements. If, for example, you need to conduct an investigation into potential wrongdoing, then your approach is going to look quite different. Um, plus, the nature of the scale and scale of the business is going to affect matters because there's always a question of proportionality. But just looking at general mis-selling type issues, in this circumstances, you're probably going to be notified because there's been a significant breach of a rule or other requirement. So number one, identify the issue. Here, the key is to explain the specific issues because there may be several and identify the applicable time frames in respect of each of those issues, um, explaining it succinctly and in a factual basis. And that might be, for example, in a misselling context that risks haven't adequately been explained or there's been a failure to explain or a charge or exclusions haven't been made clear, just by way of example. Moving on to the second box, assessing the impact. You need to think about the impact on past, current and future business with a particular focus on clients or customers. And as I said before, a key focus for the FCA, given one of its op operational objectives is to protect consumers, is going to be on whether the issue has led to a risk of potential customer harm. Not about actual harm, all about risk. And if there's a risk, then this needs to be considered and analysed. And often when clients come to me, they say, oh, well, there's this issue, but there's no actual customer harm here, so I don't know why the FCA would be particularly concerned. And the question the FCA will always have in response to that is, well, how do you know there's no actual customer harm? And the secondary question is, are you looking to minimise um, the impact of this breach and are you taking this sufficiently seriously? So just to give you some examples of considerations and analysis that might be helpful with that assessment, um, pre sale you're thinking about what other statements were made, what other documents were provided, whether the customer exhibited understanding in any case, um, was there any information in writing that made the position clearer. At sale, you're thinking again about the information that was provided during the point of sale, was it available in a different way, is there anything said that balanced out some of those issues that you've identified, what do the product documents and terms say and are they sufficiently clear about the issue? Post sale, you're looking at it from a slightly different angle. So you're thinking about have there been any specific complaints about this issue that has arisen? Um, have there been any FOS referrals? Um, anything else that identifies that actually there was a problem, for example, levels of cancellation? You might want to conduct compliance file reviews to see how this issue played out in practice. 
has it been identified um, uh, by an audit before perhaps. And then looking at that final box, actions. And you can think about it in two, two, two ways, looking forwards and looking back. So in terms of your immediate steps, and that's likely to be a priority and one that the SEA is going to be focused on, is preventing further potential harm. So what are you doing with your new business to stop this issue arising? Do you need to cease the relevant business while working out the issues? Are there any quick fixes? If it was a problem employee, for example, could they be disciplined and retrained? Often you, you do with this new business, which can be a really tricky area. You know, you don't, nobody wants to stop business entirely and it's rarely practical to do so. So often with our clients, it's about trying to balance out um, the issues for customers. So for example, are they gonna be worse impact if you stopped entirely? And what would be a proportionate response here? And then looking at addressing the issue, thinking about all of your systems and controls, <coughs> excuse me, policies and procedures, <coughs> changes to sales materials, training, communications, continual assessment, reviewing matters to make sure changes are embedded. Do you need to change your documents or your promotions? Do you need to conduct disciplinary action? And then following that, how are you going to monitor the situation to make sure that the issue has been addressed? And then looking backwards, potential customer impact. So on current customers, is there anything you can do to induce the impact going forward? So for example, providing additional explanation or if charges were an issue, waiving them or refunding them. Historic customers. Now here's where you're looking at a larger subset of customers, um, most likely. So is it possible from that analysis stage where that impact assessment took place to identify categories of historic customers that may have been more affected um, and address the issues with those specific cohorts. Then finally, a bit of a word on customer contact. Now, if you do identify potential customer harm following that impact assessment stage, there may well need to be customer contact to, to address the issues identified. And you can take a blanket approach or a targeted approach, depending on your assessment of the impact. And commercials are going to affect that approach too. So, if the issue, for example, is around pensions advice or interest rate hedging products, then the impact could be tens of hundreds or even thousands for each individual. And it may be worth conducting file reviews uh, in each case to assess whether there any redress should be paid. If, for example, though, the issue is a white goods warranty insurance, then the impact is likely only going to be a few pounds per customer. And then you may well be thinking about blanket offers to refund because it's not actually going to be worth the cost of individual file reviews. So in terms of customer contact, there are various different options and various different things that you can do. You can offer file reviews, further explanations. You can offer refunds or simply send checks as people did in the PPI era. You can conduct customer satisfaction surveys, but a bit of a warning, um, the FCA are often unconvinced by this approach. Customers shouldn't really be expected to determine whether a regulatory failing had an impact on them. Customer contact, again, it's really a topic in itself. Um, but it's only likely to be a one-size-fits-all approach. Now, I've worked on matters where each of the approaches above have been adopted, and it's an art, very much an art, not a science. But the key always is demonstrating that proactivity and making the FCA understand that the matter is all in hand and something that they can continue just to monitor. So that's the sort of what next. I'll pass back to um, Catherine now, who's going to talk a little bit about privilege and communication. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so the FCA has got the power to require firms to provide documents to assist it with its investigations, but it can't require a firm to deliver up documents which are protected by privilege. So as, as such, it's really helpful if privilege over investigations into report into reportable instance can be claimed um, and that that privilege can apply to documents generated as part of those investigations. Um, so really what, what am I talking about privilege? Um, broadly speaking, it's going to protect communications between a firm and its lawyers, um, particularly where there's any kind of legal advice. And it's a little bit like a protective wrapper. So it, it stops those documents having to be, be shared. Um, 
it's really helpful because it can allow your firm to take legal advice, for example, about the scope of any investigations, the likely consequences of making a report, um, the way the fat strategy uh, for dealing with the FCA is formed. Um, and in doing all of those things, those, those documents and communications don't then have to be disclosed um, or the advice that's in them disclosed to the FCA or other third parties. Uh, now, privilege is a huge topic and I just don't have time to cover it here fully. Um, there is a link on the slide um, to a relatively recent um, webinar that Rachel um, gave with another colleague um, in which uh, privilege is considered in quite some detail. And Rachel actually um, considers privilege in a specific context of um, investigations uh, in that webinar. Um, and that, that section can be found from 23 minutes and 25 seconds in the recording. Um, the issue with privilege is as helpful as it is, it can also be lost. Um, now, the loss of privilege is almost always unintentional. So, for example, um, you'll inadvertently share documents which are privileged with third parties, um, and that can actually include your auditors, um, experts and compliant consultants. And it, in some instances, it can even include employees of the firm. And once you've lost privilege, it's not going to be regained. Um, now, this is really important because if you're thinking with sort of one eye on the investigation and one eye down the road, um, obviously you want to protect the privilege in the investigation, but also um, what starts as an investigation could lead to litigation. So for example, disgruntled customers could, could bring claims. And you want to be able to maintain privilege um, both during the investigation and then also during the litigation so that those documents generated as part of the earlier investigation don't have to be disclosed. Um, so to preserve privilege as far as possible, and also to try and avoid creating um, documents which are going to be potentially unhelpful, um, we suggest some uh, really quite simple do's and don'ts. They're on the screen. I'm not going to take you through them one by one. Um, but essentially, um, written communications should be quite limited until you've taken legal advice and, and engaged lawyers, and um, you want to try and control the documents um, and who, who sees them as part of the investigation. Um, the do's and don'ts list, it's a very simple list. We give the same kind of guidance if we are advising clients about litigation. Um, but if you apply the, these do's and don'ts um, and then you go on to instruct lawyers, we or, or they um, will be able to assist you in setting up a more formal communications protocol and also determining your frames of reference and that will help you to maintain um, privilege going forward um, and hopefully to give that little extra protection. Rachel. Thanks Catherine um, and just just a final word by me before we move on to um, questions about engagement um, by the FCA. So from my recent experience this has been very mixed. Uh, they may be very active or they may be very inactive. Um, and you can take a lack of engagement as a, a tentatively positive sign, um, but there really is nothing to stop the FCA coming back at a later stage and taking an interest in asking questions, um, requesting meetings, for example. Um, it can often at times feel like you're having a bit of a conversation with yourself, particularly through that updates process. So, you know, just constantly, you know, sending another update, to tell them how, you, how you're getting on and and really not hearing an awful lot back. Um, but you should always assume, because they probably are, someone is looking at it at the other end and considering the matter. Um, and in fact, this happened on a matter of mine very recently after 18 months of inactivity, the FCA suddenly popped up and made, made quite an unfavorable decision that we then had to, to work with. So I, that's just a way of saying it is important to continue to be proactive and control the issue so far as you can, um, because ultimately um, the FCA may at any point um, start asking questions. So just moving on to the final slide on questions. Um, I think we are running really short on time, but just to deal with one of the questions that we've raised. Um, if you're notifying about an issue in respect of a regulated individual, do you need to notify twice? Um, I assume once in respect of the obligation to notify about the firm issue and then the individual issue. 
Um, the answer is if you're dealing um, with a senior management function holder, then no, you only need to notify once and you do that in respect of the individual issue. Um, but if you're dealing with a wider um, rule breach, a wider COCOM rule breach, so code of conduct rules for wider members of staff, then you do need to notify twice. And the reason for that is because um, COCOM breaches only need to be notified annually, um, but the firm notification is immediate. And so that's the reason why you're notified twice in those circumstances. So I think um, that just ends the matter, uh, the subject for today. I just want to say thank you very much for joining us. Um, and thanks for asking questions. If anyone has any further questions, please do get in touch with us um, and let us know if any other topics you'd like to see covered because we really appreciate your thoughts. Thanks very much.